Well, it's a, it's a real joy and a pleasure to be with you this morning, to be able to look at God's word together. I just want to start by, by opening in a word of prayer, so would you bow your, your heads with me? Lord God, we're thankful this morning to be with you, to be uh, given the opportunity to open your word and to hear from you, and know that you speak clearly to us through the words of scripture. So I pray now, as, as we take a moment to do this, would you... First, cause our hearts to be soft to what we're about to hear. Give us humility. And also give us the eyes to see the truth that you want us to see this morning as we look at this great story from Genesis, Father. We thank you and we love you. And we're here for you to make you known. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Amen. Uh, If you don't know, if you're new here, uh, I want to welcome you here. We're in the middle of a, a summer series looking at different stories in the Old Testament. Um, and today we're going to be looking at one of the, probably the more well-known stories in, in our Bibles and in the Old Testament from Genesis 22. This is the story of Abraham uh, who was called to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Um, and, and, and regardless of your, your religious background or maybe where you've come from today, you've probably heard this story and it's, it's impossible to, to not see the, the ways in which this story has impacted even, even our culture today. It's, it's, it's a a story that invokes such great emotion, and and I trust that we're going to be able to see those um, emotions drawn out as we we read this together. It's it's a story about faith and devotion, but but it's also a story that brings us to a, a bit of a crisis about the nature of God and the problem of humanity. And it really causes us to have to be honest with with not only ourselves, but with the text. And so that's, that's what I hope to do here this morning with you. We're going to dive into this story together. Uh, we'll spend some time first reading the text together. Um, I'll hope to explain some of the bit of the context behind it. And, and then we'll look at three different things that I want to stop and look at from this passage. Um, I'll tell you them now if you're, if you're a note taker. Number one, we're going to look at Abraham's faith. We're going to look at God's providence. And we're going to look at the perfect lamb. Abraham's faith, God's providence, and the perfect lamb. So, let's, lamb. so let's, let's open our Bibles to Genesis 22. I'm going to start reading in verse 1 together. Let's, let's study this passage together. Verse 1 says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And we're going to pause there. It's important, of course, as you've heard and forced from behind this pulpit many times before, that context is extremely important in understanding Scripture. And so we remember, particularly, only seven chapters prior, that God appeared to Abraham in a vision, and he made him a promise. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation from the descendants of your family. And an 80-year-old Abraham responded saying, how are you going to do that? I'm 80 and I don't have kids. How, how, how are my descendants going to bless the world if I don't even have descendants? And Yahweh makes this promise to Abraham. He says, you will have your own son and he will be your heir. You see the stars, Abraham? Look up and and, and try and count the number of the stars. That's how great this nation will be. And it says that Abraham believed the Lord. Years pass and and still no son has been born to Abraham and Sarah. And, And one day God says to Abraham, your wife Sarah, I'm going to bless her and give her a son. And many kings and great nations will come of her. And and Abraham, it says, literally, it says he laughed and said, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90, bear a child? And God says, just just wait. In a year's time, you will have a child, a son, and you're going to name him Isaac. And great nations and kings will come from him, come from him and, and sure enough, about a year later, just as the Lord promises, Abraham and Sarah conceive and have their first born son, and they name him Isaac. And you can imagine the joy 
that they would have felt. Can you imagine a hundred years of not being able to have children? And, and finally, the gift of a son. I, I can't imagine the joy and the, the awe of this miracle child they would hold in their arms. And now Isaac is growing old, becoming a young man. And one day God comes to Abraham and he says, Hey Abraham, I want you to take your, your one and only son whom you love. And I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. We, we don't see the, the response of Abraham. I, I can only imagine how he responded to this when he heard this. Did, did I hear that right? Sacrifice? I, I, can't, I can't imagine. We, we, we don't know how he responded. But he would probably have responded similar to how you and I would. God, you've promised that, that through this child a great nation would come. Why, why, would, why would these two things contradict each other? But we, we don't have Abraham's response. Instead, we get the opposite. We, we see verse 3. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. Zero hesitation. He saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. If, if there was a, ever a man who had zero doubt in the promises of God, it was Abraham. I, I don't know anyone who would wake up early in the next morning. Most of us can't even get up at our own alarm clock in the morning, and Abraham is up at the crack of dawn, ready to go and obey God. Despite all that must have been going through his head, the confusion, he says, I'm going to trust God. And so it says, on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they both of them, so they went both of them together. You notice the language of Abraham to, to his servants? Isaac and I are going to go worship, and then we're going to come back. All right? In his mind, he knew the promise of God, and he knew that no matter what happened next, God's promise has to stand. He promised it. Completely trust God. I mean, and you can remember Isaac still is, is oblivious of what is going on, right? He, he asks Abraham in, in verse 7, Isaac said to his father, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. I, I, I wonder, just over the last couple of weeks of studying this passage, I wonder if Abraham had any idea of the significance of what he had said in that moment. God will provide for himself the lamb. This, this passage contains probably one of the most obvious and, and magnificent imageries of Christ. Probably in the entire Bible. And we're, we're going to touch on that a little bit later, but I want us to just finish out this story. In verse 9, it says, When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar, and there laid the wood in order, and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I, I can't imagine. You, you can imagine as time goes on for Abraham, closer and closer to the moment, and and the closer it gets, the more he realizes, oh my goodness, am I about to do this? Then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, the relief. Here I am. He said, don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and he offered it up as a burnt 
offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that, of the, of that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Wow. What a story. And, and really, there's one big implication that we, we see if you've been around church for a while, you would know this. The thing that we learn from this passage is not hard to decipher. The reason that we have this story is so that we would be able to have faith as great as Abraham. But this is much easier said than done, isn't it? And, and so the question that I want to reflect on with you this morning as we reflect on this story together is, is the question of how. How in the world is it possible that we could have such great faith like Abraham? And I, and I, be, I believe that that's what, what God is calling us to look at through this story. So we're, we're going to start first by looking, our first point, at the nature of Abraham's faith. And then we're going to address the pathway to this faith in, in the last two points. So first, let's look, point number one, Abraham's faith. What is it about the faith of Abraham that causes us to still be reflecting on it thousands of years later in awe of, of, of how great his faith was? Why? I, I, I believe it's the fact that Abraham was willing to trust God with absolutely everything and anything in his life, even, even that of the life of Isaac. The one thing in the world that would have meant so much to him. And we mentioned how, how this call wouldn't make sense, firstly, because of the promise of God. It would have been, how, how are these two things contradicting each other? But even if you remove the, the, the promise for a second and just imagine the anguish in Abraham's heart over the fact of, of not having his firstborn son. And this is especially important to recognize in a culture where the firstborn son meant everything. Abraham and Sarah, their worth in society and in this culture was in their firstborn son who would inherit and take care of everything that Abraham and Sarah had. And really, this is, this is what makes this test so drastic. You couldn't have picked anything more of, earth, or more of earthly value to Abraham than his, his son. The test of Abraham's faith, I think, came down to the question, is Abraham's view of God greater than everything else in his life, including his own son? Um, there's, there's a, I think, a devastating story in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, um, which we know is, is the rich young ruler, the story of the rich young ruler. We see a man who comes to Jesus asking him, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? He says, I've kept all the commandments. I've done everything right. I, I, I haven't murdered. I haven't committed adultery. I don't steal. Lord, I've kept them all. What else do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at the man, and he says, okay, just, just one more thing. Sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. In other words, Make sure there isn't anything else in your life that you treasure more than me. And put, come and put your faith in me. And the story is devastating because the man reflects, takes a moment, and thinks, I can't do that. I've got a lot of things that I, I can't part with, and my faith is in other things. His faith was in material things. But not only was Abraham willing to meet this test and, and to hold even his beloved firstborn with open hands to the Lord, say, Lord, whatever you would have with him. But even when the call of God seemed to contradict the promise of God, he doesn't even hesitate. He wakes up early to go and do what the Lord is commanding him, and, and this is what faith looks like. Lord, I don't understand why you would be calling me to do this, but there's nothing in this life that I, would, that I wouldn't give up if it would mean losing you. And so I'll obey. And I, I think my fear is that many of us are like the rich young ruler more than we are like, like Abraham. There are things on earth that we have placed our faith in, and they are not God. They're good things, 
our families, our careers, our friendships. Many of us are very good at talking the talk on the outside, and the appearance of faith is is present. Of course I love God more than anything. And when it comes to the tests of life, and, and, and by tests I mean hardships or temptations or any situation that would beg an answer to the question, where is your faith ultimately? When it comes to these rubber meets the road kind of situations, sometimes I think the test shows a different result in our own life. Um, I remember um, a few years ago, uh, probably five or six years ago now, uh, Catherine and I, my wife now, uh, were dating and uh, our relationship was getting more serious and we were looking towards getting married and, and in, in my mind, I was, I was, I was ready. Yeah, I'm, my mind is set, absolutely. And Catherine, in her mind, there were still some, some indecision, let's say. She, was, she wasn't quite set yet on, on this commitment, this huge commitment that, that we were talking about making and, and the question of, do I really want to marry this guy? And so there came a point in our relationship where, where we heard, I heard the dreaded word, I think, I think I need a break. And I thought, oh no. And, I, and so we, we took a couple days to, to, to think and reevaluate our relationship to say, is this, is this the direction we're, we're heading? And, and she took some time, she met with some friends who I think very wisely told her, what are you doing? <laughs> And a couple days later, we met up again, and then she comes running, I'm so sorry, I love you, I want to marry you, and, and, and the rest is history, and didn't take very long for her to realize, of course I want to marry this guy. <laughs> now, we, we, we look back, and it's funny to reflect on, and we tell the story to people when we talk about how, how our, our relationship and our story, but in the moment... I was devastated. I remember going to work the next day, and, and I'm thinking, this is over. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of anything else while I was working. I'm thinking, it's done. And, and the only thing that, could, that, that kept rolling through my head is, am I going to be okay if I lose this relationship? Has my identity become so wrapped up in, in this relationship that I don't know if I'm going to do if it's gone tomorrow? And it it was as if the Lord was asking me, Mitch, do do you love me with everything? What are you putting your faith in? You ever been through moments where you you feel like the Lord is is asking you this question? Maybe a season of sickness or loss or pain or brokenness in your life where you're faced with with, with the practical answer of the question, what is my faith really in? What am I clinging to? Is it in other people? Is it in my appearance? Is it in material possessions? Is it, is it in things that are temporal that will fade away? Or is it in a God who has a perfect track record in keeping his promises? Do you love God more than anything? Would anything threaten your faith in who he is and what he has done? I I pray that the answer would be the same as Abraham, that we would be willing to hold even the dearest things in our lives, the good things given by him, and say, Lord, you are my greatest treasure. There is nothing more that I cling to but you. That's the kind of faith Abraham had. And I I think it's the kind of faith he's calling us to in this story, and now really the question is, if we understand that, is how in the world can we have faith like this? How can we have faith like Abraham? And so secondly, I want to look at what I think is maybe an answer to this by looking at the providence of God. Point number two, the providence of God. What do you think gave Abraham the motivation to do what he did? What, what do you think was going through his mind as he was walking up this mountain knowing the call that God had placed on his life. One of the the great things about this story is that I think we actually have an explanation for this in our New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, um, 
it talks about in, in chapter 11, verses 17 to 19, it, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered, and I think here's, here's our answer, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Listen, what drove Abraham up that mountain, willing to obey God, was the fact that even though he couldn't provide an explanation for the next few moments of what was going to take place, he was absolutely certain that God was going to provide for him. Even if that meant that God would actually need to raise Isaac from the dead. He believed it. He believed it with all his heart. He knew what God had called him to do, but he also knew and believed with absolute certainty that God always keeps his promises, without exception. And so for Abraham, and I think this is key, knowing the details of how God would provide was not essential for him to be able to believe that God would provide. Abraham didn't have any idea how, I think, how God was, would provide. He had faith that he would, but I don't think he knew the details, right? And we know this because Isaac asked him, hey, dad, we got the wood, we got the fire, where's the lamb? What's, what's going on? This, is, this isn't looking right. And he says, God will provide a lamb. How? I don't know, but I know he will. He did not know how God would provide, but yet he was absolutely certain in the providence of God, and that is what allowed him to walk up that mountain in obedience. And listen, some of us are sitting at the bottom of a mountain facing a test in our life right now, and we're hesitant to walk up the mountain and obey because of the uncertainty of how God will provide. It's very easy for us to look at our circumstances and think, this is hopeless. I have no idea how God will possibly provide and take care of me and love me through this. It doesn't make any sense from my vantage point. And and how easy it would have been for Abraham to say this. What are you doing, Lord? You want to know how the Bible defines faith? Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, the certainty of things not seen. In other words, faith is an act in which we trust in the unseen future providence of God, even in the midst of circumstances where we could not possibly see how he could provide. Look, many of you are in, in, in extremely difficult circumstances where your, your faith is being tested. And from our limited vantage point as human beings, there is no explanation for how in the world God might provide for us. Maybe it's financially. You, you, you don't know how you would have enough money to put food on the table for your family. Maybe you've got a terminal illness. Maybe you've lost a loved one recently. Maybe a relationship has been damaged so badly that the, the possibility of it being mended is just unimaginable. I don't, I don't know your circumstances, but I, I know that many of you who are here today are in the middle of the greatest tests of faith that God is leading you through, and from a limited human perspective, we don't have the answers, the specifics, the details. But we do have a hope that God keeps his promises. And so let me ask you the question, do you believe that God will provide for you like Abraham believed he would provide for him? I know, I know you can't understand how, but do you trust that he can and that he will give you everything that you need? Do you have a big view of God like Abraham? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things not seen. So look to what is unseen. Look to what is promised. Trust in the perfect track record of our God. 
and leave the details to him. You can have faith like Abraham if you know and are certain of the unfailing providence of God. Lastly, and probably most importantly, the perfect lamb. We cannot look at this story without looking to Jesus and and seeing the gospel in this story. But to do that first, I think we need to understand not only the dilemma that Abraham faced, but also the dilemma that we face. The dilemma that Abraham faced was, was that, number one, God had called him to sacrifice his son, which, by the way, as, as drastic as it was, was not unjust for God to do. Many people read this story and they think, how could God demand such a thing? How, God would never ask anyone to do that. Listen, there, there is a debt of sin that every single human being who has ever lived owes, with the exception of our Lord Jesus, And the price of that debt is life itself. God is holy, and humans, along with Abraham and Isaac, are not holy. And and, and God and holiness cannot exist together. And so to say that God is not worthy of any sacrifice would be an extremely shallow and an incorrect view of, of the holiness of God. And so the dilemma for Abraham here is that the same God who, who justly is calling for this sacrifice is also the same God who has made such great promises to Abraham. Hebrews eleven seventeen captures this dilemma perfectly. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up, offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. How can a God who rightly calls in this debt of sin also be the God who says through Isaac will all things be blessed? In other words, how can a transcendent, holy, perfect God, because of his very nature, have nothing, who who can have nothing to do with sin, also be the God who wants relationship and wants to bless you and I? How can a God of holiness be a God of grace? And when we think of it this way, we see that Abraham's dilemma is actually our dilemma. How in the, whole, how, how in the world can a holy God love a wretched sinner like me? If he's holy, how could he, he love me because he knows me and, and he knows my sin And if he's just, then how can he truly love me? How can he truly love something that is broken? And look, there is only one answer for this. And that is our God has provided the perfect lamb of sacrifice. And this is the glory of the gospel. That centuries later, God our Father led his one and only perfect firstborn son, whom he loved, up the very same mountains of Moriah, which would later be known as Golgotha. And this son, like Isaac, carried the wood for his sacrifice up that hill. And that day, unlike Abraham and Isaac, this son was not spared. He was killed. And the reason Isaac was not killed and God provided a lamb is because the lamb pointed to the greater lamb to come. The ram caught in the thicket wasn't a worthy sacrifice. We know this. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But when the perfect lamb, the son of God, when he was not spared, that's a worthy sacrifice. And so look, you and I know something that Abraham does not know in that moment. We know the solution to the greatest dilemma in the world. How can God be just and gracious? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever would believe shall not perish, but have eternal life. God can therefore be just and gracious, transcendent, and imminent. He wants relationship with us. B- both of these can exist. And this is the greatest hope in the world. And so, look, as, as we close, I want to give you two reasons why this is, this is the greatest hope 
in the world. Firstly, our world needs a just God to do away with evil and brokenness that we see around us. I I don't know if you watch the news. If you don't, let me spare you the trouble. It doesn't look good out there right now. Our world is extremely broken and filled with evil. Can, Can you imagine living in a world this broken and not having any hope in a just God? The only thing I can think of worse than a world filled with evil as we see it today is a world in which that evil would never see justice. But the hope of the Lamb of God, the hope of Christ, says that one day we will all stand before him and he will call in his death and evil will be dealt with. Amen? Amen. If God was not just, evil could not be dealt with. Secondly, why this is the greatest hope in the world, if God was not gracious, none of us would have a future. The the flip side of this justice is that you and I, if if we're honest with ourselves, we know what we deserve. That on that future day when God calls in his debt, we know that our balance is higher than what we could pay. But listen, the hope of the Christian is that instead of being the object of wrath, we are the object of mercy. Instead of us hearing our debt read out, to us, those of us who believe in the sacrifice of Christ, the the perfect lamb will hear the words, my son, my daughter, your debt is paid. Someone paid it for you. You're no longer owing. Your debt is paid. And so listen, as, as we close, this should cause something in us. We mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to answer the question, how is it that we can have faith as great as Abraham? 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says, for the love of Christ compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The love of Christ should cause us to say, Lord, I don't know why or how you have called me into the circumstance or test that I am in, but I do know that you have provided your son as a sacrifice for my sin so that I now have a future with you. And if you were willing to do that for me, then how can I ever choose not to trust you with everything? And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us see this. Help us to see and know the perfect Lamb. To know that our debt is canceled because of your Son, who died, who suffered and died, and who is alive. Help us to remember and to glory in this. Would we be in awe of this? And would it drive us to faith and knowledge in who you are and, 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 and your perfect track record, that you do, not, you do not break your promise? Father, as we move to communion, would we see this evident in the, in, in the elements of the bread and the cup? Would we remember this perfect sacrifice? We love you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.